Kia ora and welcome to this video on heat. Today we're going to look at the three types of heat transfer, exactly how tr heat is transferred on the, on the molecular level, and finally we're going to look at some materials that can insulate and conduct our heat. So without further ado, let's get into it. We're going to start here with a star. This star is a mass of extremely hot gas and it emits heat and light energy produced by nuclear reactions. Our sun consists of this extremely hot gas, and they're held together in a sphere by gravity. Nuclear reactions occur inside our sun. Hydrogen is changed into helium, and huge amounts of energy are released. The interior temperature is about 14 million degrees Celsius, and the surface temperature is about 5,800 degrees Celsius. The nuclear fusion reaction inside the sun generates electromagnetic radiation in the form of energy and we looked at some of this energy last lesson so our sun is a great example of some of the types of energy we have already looked at light on the visible spectrum but also radio waves and ultraviolet light and a lot of heat particularly infrared the sun does make some x-rays but our atmosphere stops them from reaching Earth's surface. So there is a great example of many of the different types of energy and energy transfers we looked at in our last video. But today we're going to focus on what we all feel in summer is the sun's heat. So how does heat transfer? Well, there are three main methods. The first one over here is the radiation method, where heat is sent out as wavelengths, infrared, and you can feel that if you're standing across the room and you've got an extremely hot object. That's when you put your hands out and warm yourself by the fire. The second one we have also looked at, whenever we boil water to make a cup of tea or a coffee, or if we're talking about plate tectonics, we're talking about convection. Convection is how heat is transferred in liquids and gases. And finally, we're talking about conduction, where a solid object can be heated up and the heat is transferred along that object. So we're going to unpack why these are the methods of transfer, but first we need to do a little bit of chemistry. So, some of you may have already done the chemistry unit, so this will just be revision. For those that haven't, don't panic, I'm going to go over it here. So, if we're looking at transferring energy, particularly in a solid, we're talking about conduction. When heat is transferred by conduction, the atoms remain in a fixed solid position. That's what makes something solid. And the heat is transferred from one atom to another by being carried by moving electrons surrounding the atoms. The more heat energy that is added, the electrons will move faster. So, what is an electron if you haven't done the chemistry unit? Here is our atom, the thing that comprises everything that is made up of matter. In our electron we have the central part of it called the nucleus. In the nucleus we have two subatomic particles, the proton, which is positively charged, and the neutron, which is a neutral subatomic particle. They are the big particles that make up our atom. Surrounding our atom are these tiny particles, but they are extremely important, called electrons. Now, electrons are negatively charged, and they are what gives us electricity and things like that. So electrons are these things that are buzzing around really fast. You can see the laser pointer there, boom, boom, boom. They are providing that nucleus with energy. That energy can be transferred if the atoms are really close to each other, which is what is being depicted in this diagram. So if you start heating an object down this end, all the atoms, their electrons will get excited, and that energy they create will be passed on. So, so forth until all of the atoms are being heated because of the movement of the electrons increasing. So some materials conduct better than others. They are called conductors and include metals, which have more free electrons on the outer shells to move around. 
Those metals that cannot conduct heat are known as insulators, and they have much less free electrons, so they don't travel, uh, don't allow the heat to travel as much. So this is why we wrap things um, like uh, saucepan handles in plastics and rubber because they are non-metals that don't conduct heat. The same principle applies for electricity. We often hear about insulating tape or insulating wires so the electricity can't be transferred dangerously into someone that grabs a wire. Same principle, electricity moves through the free electrons in the outer shells of our atoms. So if that's a bit confusing, don't worry, you'll cover it in more detail in your chemistry unit. But just remember, heat transfer in conduction is by the free electrons moving around faster. Here are some examples of insulators. Down this end, we have the more insulating materials. Okay, man-made plastics are good insulators of heat because they have no free electrons by design. So they can't have any charged particles on the outside moving around to pass on that energy. Whereas down this end, the more naturally conceived things, the metals and stones, they're good conductors of heat because they do have these free electrons to pass on that energy. Okay, now something really interesting happens when things are heated. When matter expands or contracts due to heating, only the space between the particles changes. So we've got a cold object here and a hot object. You can see they're the same in terms of the number of atoms and the same in terms of the size of the, the core of the atoms, but it's this space that is increasing between them. The particles in a solid vibrate more when it is heated and take up more space. The particles in a liquid move around each other more when it is heated and take up more space. And finally, the particles in a gas move more quickly in all the directions when it is heated and they take up more space. And this links to our states of matter that I'll cover towards the end. And if you've already done the chemistry unit, this will make a lot of sense. Because if you heat these up more, they will start moving and changing state from solid to liquid because they've got more space between them and then can start moving. Where is this an issue in modern day life? Well, we have to plan ahead. Matter expands or gets bigger when it's heated up. It contracts or gets smaller when it's cooled down. Some types of matter, such as metals, conduct heat very well and therefore the effects of the expansion and contraction are more obvious. Structures, such as bridges and railway tracks, that are made out of metal have to be built with gaps so that they don't start warping, bending um, when they're exposed to the higher temperatures during summer. So next time you're walking past the train tracks um, over there, be safe, but you might like to notice where they connect. There's a small little gap to allow that expansion, particularly in the unpredictable Wellington um, summers. In terms of the context of us, spaceships have to deal with massive extremes of heat and cold and that will be the um, crux of your investigation for this video. When you heat air in a balloon you increase the kinetic energy and we know it's the movement energy of the air particles. The air particles absorb heat energy and this makes them move faster. So we're just looking at the solids now we're looking at the gases air particles are pushed out of the balloon as they take up more space. A hot air balloon rises because it is filled with this hot and when we get that bigger space between the molecules we become less dense, so lighter. And the air is surrounded by the cooler, more dense air so it tries to rise. And you can see this here, we've got the cooler air particles are closer together, we've got the warmer air, the particles are further apart and they're moving faster. So we all know when things are less dense, they rise. Okay, So that is why we can have hot air balloons. It's pretty interesting. Now, moving on to convection currents. So convection currents occur when the free-moving particles found in liquids, so these are just the whole atoms, and gases have heat energy added to them. The gas slash liquid particles gain this kinetic energy, remember the energy that allows us to move, and as they collide into each other, they are pushed apart more. So if you hit each other, so if you imagine two rugby players smashing into each other, 
if they hit each other hard enough, they're going to bounce. Okay, the hotter area of the liquid becomes less dense or lighter, and then rises just like that hot air balloon example, and it rises away from the heat source. As the particles lose the energy, they slow down, they become closer together, which makes them more dense, heavier, so they start to sink back down. This movement creates this thing called convection currents, where the particles circulate. Like this, so hot, get less dense, rise up, cool down, get more dense, sink down. Okay. This movement creates these convection currents, where the particles circulate, and in liquids, the hotter and expanded the less dense substance rises above the cooler and denser liquids. This creates this current and causes the movement of particles containing the heat energy. The other example where we know this happens is here. When our molten magma under the Earth's surface moves due to convection currents, when the heat from the Earth's core causes it to expand. So just like we saw with our beaker, the heat source being the Bunsen burner in our planet, the heat source is the core. When the magma reaches the Earth's surface, under the crust it cools, contracts, gains density, so then starts sinking. Okay, and this is why we have our crust and plates moving, and that is a topic for our Earth and Space Unit. So, we've just looked at, as matter expands, the density the mass of the matter in a given volume will decrease, making it lighter. In a gas, the warmer particles that are moving faster due to their increased kinetic energy are colliding with each other more. This creates more space between them and the particles, and therefore it makes the area of gas less dense. The less dense gas will rise above the colder, more dense gas, and this is why hot air rises to the top of a ceiling in a heated house. Heat expands the space between the particles and causes the balloon to inflate in this diagram. You could do this experiment at home very carefully with adult supervision, but if you heat a bottle in some warm water that's empty, you will be able to inflate a balloon. In terms of where this is practical, the Industrial Revolution was driven by this process. This caused a massive increase in technological advancement um, about 150 years ago. Um, heating water to create expanding steam-powered engines is what began this revolution and is the process that drives many of our power stations to create steam that drives turbines um, today. So there's a bit of history for you. So hopefully you've got that about this gas expanding, liquids moving faster and becoming, um, and the uh, differences in density causing this movement. So what if we don't have particles for heat to move in? Well, a hot object emits this other type of energy which we call radiation or infrared. Heat energy can be transferred not through particles like we've just looked at with the atoms, but also in waves. Waves is how energy is transferred. It doesn't need a medium, which is those particles. Air is a medium, water is a medium, a solid is a, is a medium. And our greater source of radiation comes from the sun, which is why I started this little video with that. Now, interestingly enough, the type of object the radiation hits will have an effect on it. White and silver objects reflect our radiation, and they take very little heat energy from that radiation whereas black objects absorb this radiation and very little is reflected and a large portion of that heat energy is transferred to them. So you can see that in this diagram here. So next time it's a really hot day, you'll be able to go out and feel a, hot, a dark surface and a light surface and you'll feel the difference in temperature. This is why our solar caps in the Arctic and Antarctic are so important to aiding the cooling of our planet. Heading back to the sun, the sun releases large amounts of energy and this energy can be emitted from the energy source in the form of all these electromagnetic radiations that we talked about at the start. And here is just a really cool infographic that explains all of this. You might want to pause the video and have a quick read. 
Here's the same diagram, but it's got something extra added to it. Heat is a type of electromagnetic radiation. In the last video, we looked at the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. There are other kinds of electromagnetic radiation, such as radio waves, microwaves, X-rays. And heat travels as infrared rays. Infrared waves are here. Sorry, I couldn't find it. <laughs> are here just before the visible light spectrum. And now all types of EM radiation together are known as the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is everything we have in terms of our energy wavelengths. Light and other types of electromagnetic radiation from the sun and even further away stars travels through space in a vacuum. There's no molecules, particles, compounds, atoms for it to go through, or very, very few. And this is how light travels. Light does not need this matter or a substance through to which it can travel. Each particular type of electromagnetic radiation includes each different color of light. Sorry, including each different color of light has a unique and fixed wavelength. And this is called um, the wavelength that it travels in. Now, here in this cool little picture, we're going to go focus on colors later, is the wavelengths. So you can see the shorter wavelengths are indigo and the bigger wavelengths are here. And you hear the word infrared. That's because we move into the red spectrum down here, and this is where heat travels through. Okay, So then we hit the uh, visible light spectrum. This is what we see. Many animals can see different parts of our electromagnetic spectrum. So insects often see infrared if they're hunting um, us like mosquitoes uh, to suck our blood because we're warm-blooded. And down here, many insects see the purple side of the spectrum more. So finally, linking this to our states of matter, and I've just had to refilm this a little bit because I realized I had cropped bits of the video out. Now, I've gone back and checked, and most of it doesn't matter, but it did matter on this slide because most of the example part was cut out. So um, if it has affected the video in other places, I apologize. Um, the end will be is being refilmed because of it. So here we go. If you've done the states of matter video, um, you will know all about this. If you haven't, this will allow you to unpack that video even more. Um, and likewise, if you've done the states of matter, this will make more sense to you. So all it is, and I'll let you pause the video and read it, is linking what states of matter, if any, because remember we've got vacuum um, as well, link to the types of heat transfer. So obviously we know that now that convection allows um, heat to travel through liquids and gases. And you should be able to tell me why that happens now due to the particles, um, the atoms that are involved in those and what is um, really important, particularly around conduction and those free electrons. So have a quick pause, watch, uh, read through this, make some notes um, and then hit play again when you're ready to move on. So to wrap this video up, here is my little analogy for you to remember them. Um, you know, it's our, it's our national game, so here is um, how you remember the heat types of heat transfer through the game of rugby. So firstly, convection. This required particles to move around in things such as a liquid and a gas and carries around the heat energy like a rugby player carrying and running with the ball. So the whole atom moves around faster, the bumping into each other um, of the atoms um, is like a rugby player carrying and running with the ball. Radiation, however, does not need any of these particles to move um, the heat energy. It uses waves. This is like a rugby ball being kicked. Doesn't Once it's being kicked, it doesn't need um, the rugby player to move. It moves all by itself through the air, um, doesn't need the rugby players, the atoms, um, so it goes down the field without any players required. So that is radiation. And finally, conduction um, is when heat is passed it's from one atom to another, one uh, where heat energy is passed from particle to particle, and this occurs in solids, when the particles are in a fixed place. This is like a rugby player passing the ball to another player. So the rugby players in this analogy are the atoms, okay, in two of them we need those. One, the atom moves itself with the ball all the way around, the ball is the heat, and then the middle one is the radiation, which doesn't need the players involved once they kick the ball. The ball travels by itself. Okay, so hopefully that just makes it a little bit easier for you. 
any questions, fellas, or um, anything that you need uh, clarifying, hit me up in class. I'll see you there.